you for taking the time out to come and be part of this exciting conversation about our shared future. Now please write into us what you make of the event today. But for now, on with the show. We still 2013 Cultivate the Intellect, UKC. Our final speaker of the first half is Dr. Hugh Scully. Now, Dr. Scully is from Toronto, Canada, where he's a professor of surgery at the University of Toronto. His resume is quite impressive, but to hit on a few of the highlights, he's the past president of the Canadian Medical Association. He's chairman emeritus of the International Institute of Motorsport Sciences, and to top it off, he's the only physician in the Canadian Motorsport motor Hall of Fame. We're here to talk about the intersection of medicine and motorsport, Dr. Hughes Gulley. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be here with you. A number of my colleagues in surgery uh, emigrated from Toronto to watch you and have done very well here and are leaders in the faculty and uh, internationally. What I wanted to do today was to talk to you about a different subject, and it may be an oxymoron that there is safety in motorsport, but there have been tremendous changes over the years, and there are a few of us who have been involved, and I'd like to tell you that story. If we look back in terms of racing, the first race from Paris to Rouen, 79 miles, was a long time ago. I paid attention to that and paid attention to other aspects of racing and people say, how come a surgeon gets involved in something like motorsport? Well, as a surgeon, using one of the identities that we heard about earlier, we work with a team, we communicate, we make decisions under pressure in a hurry and live with the consequences and try and follow through. That becomes very important. The seminal moment for me was in 1974 at the Formula One race in Watkins Glen. I had been involved in racing for a number of years. It was a very sexy pastime. I met a lot of good people. I met a lot of drivers. There were a lot of attractive people. It was different than the intensive care environment. <laughs> However, I was the, the guest of one of the drivers from Austria. His suspension broke. The car went into the barrier. He was killed, decapitated. It fell to me to bring the other driver in to deal with the team, deal with the team owner, identify the individual, collect his clothes, and call his wife at home in Austria. I did all of that because I'd been trained to deal with that kind of contingency, but the next day I drove around speaking to myself and this has to do with the faith issue that you just heard about, the inner voice. So said, Scully, you either have to stay in this and try and make a difference, or you need to leave. So the story I want to tell you is about the difference that's taken place over the years. Now in the early days, no attention was paid to safety, you pay a prize, and people would get into it. There were no barriers, there were no safety workers, this, believe it or not, is a race car in those days, and you can see people right standing by the side. Oncoming traffic could be a big problem <laughs> in those days. Deaths were numerous, second only to <coughs> flying airplanes privately in those days in terms of activity and sport. And Carl Fisher, who founded Miami Beach, came and founded the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1909, and the first Indy 500 was in 1911. There were 80,000 spectators. In that race, a driver and his mechanic were killed, along with nine spectators. And that was the pattern that was going on. From 1911 through 1960, the deaths were usually from head injury, from fires, or a combination of the two. 
very difficult situation to deal with. And I just come into that. The other aspect that we were always concerned about and still are very concerned about, and I don't know if you've watched the NASCAR National Series last Saturday, just a week ago tonight, where cars got airborne. This is Le Mans, 1955. One of the Mercedes becomes airborne, catches fire, falls apart. 250 people were injured, 80 people were killed in that event. Completely unacceptable in terms of today's standard. During the decade of the 60s and 70s, when I first got involved and I began to know some of the drivers, one in seven was killed every year. Again, a terrible price to pay. So what happened is the drivers got together, and I got to know Jackie Stewart very well, continued to be a good friend, and they wanted to have medical records kept and more medical attention in terms of what was happening. I can tell you that here in the United States, Henry Bach, Steve Olby, and Terry Trammell began to develop the medical facility at Indianapolis. I have been doing that in Canada. And my greatest friend in life, Sid Watkins, with whom I worked for almost 40 years, was doing that in Formula One around the world. The idea was to identify the injury trends, what the mechanisms of injury were, and how we might change that, how we might change the drivers, the cars, the intervention systems, and so on. One of the things that's interesting, just to put it in perspective, an Indy car at 230 miles an hour when it crashes, has less likelihood of producing a serious injury than our cars at 50 miles an hour. That speaks a lot to what's happened in the development of the Indy cars in the meantime. In those days, the thing that happened a lot was injuries to the ankles and the feet. More than 50% of the injuries to the drivers were in that connection. So we began to study progressively deformable structures, which, by the way, have been translated into the cars that we drive every day. The feet projected into this area. So imagine if this car hits a barrier, what happens to the ankles and to the feet? This was Nelson Piquet qualifying in Indianapolis. You can see there's nothing left of the front of the car. It's only Terry Trammell's skill as an orthopedic surgeon that saved Nelson's feet and legs, he still walks with a limp, but he walks with both legs, and he's still doing very well. What we persuaded the construction people to do then was to move the position of the driver further towards the back so that the feet were at the level of the front axle. Since that time, we have not seen serious foot, ankle, lower leg problems for the majority of the accidents that have taken place. Again, an input that we were able to have. Now the cars go into barriers. Frontal impact rarely produces a neck injury. And this is a, a depiction of the way things were in the 1980s. The cars would usually go front end first. But because of a change in the construction of the cars and the balance, they go in backwards now, still. What that does is create cervical spine fractures or stress. And that has continued to be a problem. And it's aggravated by the helmet. Imagine the helmet in those days is three pounds. And you hit with 10 or 12 Gs and magnify that force. You get the pull on the base of the skull to produce a serious injury. So the skull base is effectively pulled away. The research of the International Council of Motorsport Science in Indianapolis, which I chaired for many years, did a lot of work in what's called a head and neck system the Hans device, and if any of you follow racing, you hear that discussion. And that has essentially presented, prevented the distraction that took place with the helmet and the neck. We're just not seeing the injuries anymore. This is an input that was developed in America and <coughs> transported to Europe and is now used all over the world. It was implemented first in the States in IndyCar, Formula One the next year, and a few years later into NASCAR, and has made a big difference in terms of what happened. Happily, a lot of the head injuries that take place are mild. And the mechanism is deceleration and rotation. That happens with any of us in terms of what happens with a head injury. So what we need to do is control the head in great 
deceleration and avoid the rotation that takes place that compounds the injury. What we then did going to the constructors and working with the engineers was develop a head surround system which would catch the head and prevent the rotation and the extension off to the side of the car. And since that time, we've seen far fewer concussions in road sport. Uh, the other aspect I will tell you, with this head surround material protecting the head more than was the case before, the mechanism of irritant sinus death was protrusion into the car in 1994. That hasn't happened since. So the head surround has been a very useful addition. As far as concussion is concerned, you hear a lot about that with the National Football League. You hear a lot about that with the National Hockey League. And I have speakers from both of those organizations come to speak to my group in Indianapolis and in Europe. The whole issue of the protocol of returning to competition is there, and we exercise it very formally. We wanted to lighten the helmet. So starting with work with NASA and the Top Gun program here in the United States, the materials of the helmet were changed. The lining of the helmet was changed. So it was less crushable, more resistant to penetration, more resistant to rotation, and more compatible with the materials around it, the head surround. And again, we're seeing far fewer head injuries and concussions in racing as a consequence. The spin-off of that was recognizing that youngsters have different necks and different heads than we do. There has been a whole program of development of youth helmets that's been used in karting, been used in ski racing, been used in football, and now being used in hockey. So there's a very positive association that's gone on as a consequence of this. As far as the car itself is concerned, we needed to protect the drivers more than they had been. So in series, we had fire protection built in. It's now very unusual to have a serious fire that continues in a race car. Seat belts were introduced. Novel idea. We all have to wear them these days. This is where it came from. And the progressive deformable material around the driver became mandated. And we began crash recorders in the cars. And that's in IndyCar, it's in Formula One, it's in NASCAR. <coughs> very much like the plane crash recorders. And we can analyze frame by frame the accidents and see what we can do to make a difference. I've already told you about the head and neck system. And what's happened in Indy cars, now there is a rear wheel protection to try and minimize the launching of the cars that was taking place. <coughs> the greatest concern we have, and I'll just touch on this very briefly, is in the rally cars at the present time. They hit trees. They go off cliffs. They run into spectators. We need to do something to reduce the penetration capability or crush capability of trees and barriers. And we need to do something to protect the driver and the co-driver from each other in terms of bouncing around inside the car. We focused a great deal on the drivers. One of the things you perhaps don't know, at least at the level of Formula One and the top level of IndyCar, is those folks are in great physical condition, comparable to any Olympic athlete. The Formula One drivers in the off season train four to six hours every day, six to seven days a week. And they focus a lot on upper body strength. There is no power steering. There are a lot of corners. It takes a lot of strength to handle a car. And when we think of the weight of the helmet and the force on the neck, so they do a lot of exercises for the neck. One of the things that I train our physicians to do at the end of a race is watch what's happening with the driver's heads as they're going through the corner. If they're beginning to wander off, we get in touch with the team manager and say there may be a problem here. The clothing of the driver is also very important to have fire resistant material. Clothing, the balaclava, the long underwear, the socks, the shoes, and uh, the gloves. And if they don't wear the material, they're suspended from the event. We can pull them out of the car. So they know that they have to do that. Finally, there's the issue of the course. I showed you some of the early slides of what was happening where there were no barriers. You're just spectators standing by the cars. No barriers. Here, these are photographers and people watching. This is Le Castellet 
in the south of France. It's now the model circuit in terms of different gradations of traction and friction as a car goes off the circuit. It worked very well, and we're introducing that in all of the new Formula One circuits and all of the new Indy circuits as we go to them. The other thing that's important is the debris fence. Remember I talked to you about airborne cars. This driver survived, walked away from the car, and the fence prevented the car from going into the crowd. What happened last Saturday was that there was a break in the debris fence in the start-finish line of the NASCAR event, and parts of the engine, the tire, and other parts of the car got into the crowd. That having been said, there were 19 drivers involved in the accident, none of whom were seriously injured, and there were 32 people injured in the stands, two of them seriously, but nobody killed. Tremendous transition from what used to happen in the past. What about the teams? Well, we developed rapid intervention vehicles. I believe I was the first actually in the world to do that at Mosport outside of Toronto in 1974. And then we had pursuit cars. The training of the personnel is very important. And the Race Medical Center and the trauma base. The whole idea is to arrive at the scene of an accident within 30 seconds of the time that the car stops moving so that if there is a resuscitation effort that's necessary for the driver, we're there to do it. The principle <coughs> is to take the hospital to the roadside. Same as the military principle of taking the hospital to the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is what happens now, quite different than Vietnam a number of years ago, where you brought the victim to the hospital if they lived long enough to get there. So it's made a huge difference in terms of survival. People are cross-trained. I was a physician trackside for a long time before I moved to race control. I trained in firefighting and I trained in extrication. Not that I was going to do it, it's just that the team around the car always knew what the other person was responsible for and what they were going to be doing. This is a typical IndyCar emergency team. This is the other one that I developed in Edmonton for the IndyCar races that were there. These people are paramedics, nurses, doctors, firefighters, and extrication experts. And the whole incident here is reported in race control. The safety truck goes out, followed by an ambulance if necessary, will transport either to the race medical center or to the trauma center as the case may be. This is an Indy team working on a driver, the intervention, the extrication, then the transfer to the ambulance to the Race Medical Center. Race Medical Centers in many of the circuits in the world are comparable to crash centers and emergency rooms in many hospitals. They really are very complete and very important and have saved many lives. A place like Silverstone, which is well removed from a trauma hospital, becomes very important to be able to work in the driver for the major injuries that are there before the person is transported by helicopter. The same principle is true in Formula One. In Formula One, however, the first vehicle that goes out is a medical car with an experienced driver and a very experienced physician in race medicine. The sequence then after that is a rapid intervention vehicle, and that is the ambulance. We have helicopters at many of the circuits where we need to transport from the race medical center to the trauma center. It's become essential and very important, and many drivers' lives have been saved because of that. I'm just going to wrap up with a few statistics, and I want to point out that what's happened is the dramatic decrease in deaths in open wheel cars, significant decrease here, but here's the rally situation that I'm worried about and we're working on in Paris all the time. Remarkably, and I think as a great tribute to the work that we've done, the mortality in Formula One has been zero since 1994, whether it's in the race, the qualifying, the practice, or in the testing. I'm one of the founding fellows of the FIA Institute for Motorsport Safety and Sustainability in Paris. There are a couple of other Americans and people from around the world, and our mission is to train officials and others about what's going on in racing 
and the difference we can make. We have partnerships with engineers, constructors, officials, physicians, paramedics working together as a team and doing the research. And we've just formed a medical advisory panel, only six of us on that. It will expand. It's geographically distributed. All of us have had a lot of teaching experience. And the idea is to develop a medical racing curriculum so that when people go to new venues, we know that the quality of the people is going to be very good. And I'll just show you the sequence of what happened in the Formula One race in Montreal a couple of years ago with Robert Kubicu as a driver for Formula One. He hit the wall at 174 miles an hour. And this just shows some of the barrel rolls that he did as he traveled a quarter of a mile down the circuit, finally coming to rest over against the barrier. I saw that with others and said, that's it. He was unconscious for about 20 seconds after the first intervention car got there, within 21 seconds of the car stopping. Then he was helping to get out. He had a mild concussion and a sprained ankle. We kept him out of the next race because of the mild concussion. He came back to win that race the next year. Tremendous change from what we saw in earlier years. These are the three musketeers. We're all old farts. <laughs> My greatest friend in life was Sid Watkins. Unhappily, Sid deceased in September. Jean-Jacques Isaman from Paris is still very involved and trains people around the world. And then you've got this character here. They call us the Three Musketeers uh, in terms of all of the work that we've done. The success to pick up on what Maddie was saying in terms of what it takes to make a difference, to play with the passion that you have, where you really care a lot about it, is intrepid courage, fierce innovation, innovative communication, inspired communication, and transparent communication and collaboration. Those are the keys to making the difference that we have. And I will tell you that we're still doing that. And that is still my passion and the passion of others. Thank you very much.